Aloha. Welcome to the final day of the 21st Amos Conference. Please welcome Secure World Foundation's Ian Christensen. Good morning and welcome to the third day of the 2020 Amos Conference. My name is Ian Christensen and I am Director of Private Sector Programs for the Secure World Foundation. I have the honor this morning of introducing Mr. Mark Dankberg for today's opening remarks. Mark is Chairman and CEO at Viasat, where he is also a co-founder of the company. Mark has led the company since its inception. He is an industry expert in aerospace, defense, and satellite communications, and has been the leading visionary for a new generation of high-capacity satellite systems. Mark is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and has been recognized with a number of industry awards for business leadership. Mark's remarks today will focus on an operator's perspective on safe space operations, looking at how, with appropriate regulation in place, we can put into place collision mitigation practices through which we can meet and ensure access, uh, meet the need to ensure access for operators and others' um, access to the space environment in the near and long term. Uh, please submit questions through the conference platform, and Mark will uh, graciously take a few of those at the end of his remar remarks. And Mark, with that, over to you. Thanks very much, Ian. Uh, let me uh, share my screen here first. Okay, and uh, thanks very much for having me. Uh, I wish I was actually in Maui this time. Probably can't see because it's a little bit close up, but I'm wearing my Hawaiian shirt. But I've got uh, a really, uh, I think, important presentation talking about what we need to do with safe space and how to have uh, regulations catch up with what's going on in, in the world there. And the main point I'd like to make is we, we need new policies that can balance the ability to commercialize space with the public interest in a safe space environment. And one point when it comes to these uh, large constellations is it's good to understand that broadband from space is already here in both uh, geosynchronous orbit and not geosynchronous orbits in applications like in-flight connectivity, con connections to cruise ships at sea, rural uh, residences, and in remote villages uh, around the world in, in some of the hardest to reach places. And, and one good indication of that is uh, Fortune Magazine uh, puts out a list of those companies that they think are having the most impact on changing the world. And this is the most recent issue uh, with a list like that. Uh, it's from last year. Uh, as an example, IBM was number 22. JP Morgan was number 38. Uh, in this particular issue, you can see in the lower left hand corner, Viasat was uh, listed as number 12 on that list because of the work that we're doing in remote communications where we're dealing not just with geographic uh, issues, but with economic issues where we're providing now, uh, making broadband available at very affordable prices uh, to millions of people in tens of thousands of schools in Brazil and Mexico and now uh, just now entering other countries in Latin America. What, one of the things that uh, is most important if you're purpose is to provide communications is to have a good understanding, first of all, of what the demand model is. That is, where do people want communications? Every terrestrial system that's put together goes through this step. And so one of the things that we're going to show here is some examples of, of what that implies uh, in putting together a space-based communication system. So this just gives some examples of some uh, geographic databases that are available that provide information on uh, population density, household uh, density, and uh, economics. And then these provide very small grid cells that you can use to anticipate and provision for the demand around the world. And then one of the things to think about when you're doing this from space is to realize that the spacecraft themselves are really just towers that what you're doing when you do space, when you do broadband or communications from space is the spacecraft is the platform on which you build your communication network. But just as in a terrestrial environment, where those towers are is usually important to the efficiency and the effectiveness of 
of your, of your delivery system. So you wanna put the towers where the demand is and not put them where there's no demand. So one of the things we're showing here, which you think is, is really striking both economically and from the perspective of, of space pollution or space safety, is what happens when you have tens of thousands of spacecraft and you uh, try to display their location relative to demand. So what you're seeing here is a flat earth model, which makes it a little more evident uh, what's going on. The, Bright yellow spots, which have peaks on them, are the places where there are people, primarily, and, and some combination of people and economic activity. And the, all the little white dots that you can see are where satellites, it's a freeze frame of where satellites would be with 42,000 satellites and using, the, uh, as an example, the orbits, the exact orbits for which SpaceX has uh, filed for their uh, Starlink system. And one of the most striking things you can tell is that when you have that many satellites, especially satellites that are that close to Earth, that the vast majority of them are in places where there actually is no demand and, and, and almost uh, certainly never will be. And that's partly because 50% you know, of the people in the world live on 1% uh, of the land, about 95% live on 5% of the land, and land is only about 27% of the surface of the Earth. So this has uh, economic impact as well. If you want to provide affordable, low-cost broadband, then you, you really need an economically delivered uh, broadband network. And this is a chart from Morgan Stanley uh, that was put out just recently that compares the cost per gigabit per second per month of uh, a few different systems. Uh, here on the left, they show that what the range is that they compute would be for SpaceX. Uh, next is for conventional or advanced uh, high throughput satellite KU band. This is Viasat 2, a satellite that we launched uh, uh, almost three years ago. Uh, and you can see that, or over three years ago, and you can see that, that that's pretty much consistent with the upper end of the, the best end of what could happen with SpaceX. And this is Viasat 3, which is expected to be launched next year and represents an, another quantum step in performance improvement. Then just for context, we show where Viasat 1 was. We launched this satellite almost 10 years ago. And Viasat 4, which is the next generation we're already working on. And, and this box just gives you some of the sense of what makes economics challenging for LEOs. Uh, one is the short life of each, of each low cost satellite, and the other is the fact that very little of the bandwidth is useful because of the locations of where the satellites are. Uh, so the other, the other point is that you want something that not only is economically productive, but scalable. And obviously there are protocols for scaling geosynchronous satellites to very high degrees, because uh, there's lots and lots of places to put uh, satellites, and all of those satellites can be focused only on the places where there's demand, because they have a field of view that encompasses essentially a third of the Earth for each one. And so the, one of the points is satellite broadband is responding to the market, that while everybody should be very receptive to any new advance that can improve uh, the availability of broadband and uh, reduce the cost. The, the main point is that we don't need to do things that are imprudent from a space collision risk merely to advance uh, global broadband because it's happening already at a good pace. So w w there are multiple ways in which existing policies did not address the concept of these mega constellations with tens of thousands of satellites. Number one is we're already seeing contention for orbits. You can see with the, with the number of satellites that, that were shown in the prior illustration, that that doesn't leave a lot of room for other constellations. And so you're seeing uh, contention for orbits and orbital trajectories. Uh, also, one of the points is that in an effort to make the satellites inexpensive, some operators have very large variances or tolerances in the altitudes that they occupy, in the orbital space that they occupy, in order to try to, to be cost effective. And that has a big impact on how you can deal with orbits that may be interleaved or overlap with each other. Also, one of the concerns is that because of the very large numbers of satellites, 
there's a fear that, that the system designs from some operators are designed to tolerate high failure rates instead of preventing high failure rates of those satellites. And that has substantial collision probability implications, which I'll show. Uh, and then it also creates uh, spectrum coordination issues that are unique and very significant. So the, the points we want to make here is that these very large constellations occupy disproportionately more orbital trajectories than, than the, the, the mission, the service mission that they accomplish. And so you would think that you'd want policies that should promote accomplishing a particular mission with the fewest satellites needed, which would avoid you know, polluting space more than you need to in the first place and leave more room for, for competition and, and new innovation. So let's go directly to the orbital debris implications of this. And that's, that's probably the most pressing place where we need new, we would need new policies to encompass these mega constellations. So uh, fortunately, the FCC has been uh, aware of this issue and has proposed a metric that deals with this situation. And that's uh, what's called a per constellation collision metric. So this integrates with the NASA debris assessment system, uh, model uh, that basically uses the, what's called the flux uh, density uh, of uh, debris in space combined with the control and maneuverability of satellites to accomplish, uh, to achieve a low collision probability for each constellation. And it, the effect of this, if you go through the analysis, it effectively limits uncontrollable satellites that cannot avoid collisions. That the purpose of it is to have control of, of satellites so that you can avoid collisions. That, that is, satellites that you can't control can't avoid collisions. And it's light touch regulation. It doesn't specify that you can't have a large constellation. It just provides the conditions under which you can have a large constellation. And so that enables innovation and trade-offs of things like how big is the constellation, how many satellites, what's the functionality of each spacecraft, how long does it, each spacecraft uh, survive and operate, and what's the reliability needed for each spacecraft, which would impact the redundancy that you need on board each spacecraft. And one of the good things about this policy is that the actual in-orbit reliability of each spacecraft is readily observable. Uh, of at least the control system. So that minimum additional regulatory oversight is needed. You can just look and see how uh, the systems are performing. And then you can use a statistical reliability analysis of those satellites that are already on orbit to proactively preempt excessive in-orbit failures. So if you're seeing a high failure rate, you can uh, throttle the launch rate of future satellites. And it creates an incentive for fewer, more reliable satellites, but it doesn't make you do that. So the, uh, one of the points of this is that hey, collisions are bad. And, and what I've highlighted here is a section from the uh, preliminary notice, uh, the, uh, the notice of proposed rulemaking, where the FCC pointed out that uh, of the about 500,000 objects uh, that are tracked in space that are about 10 centimeters or one, between one and 10 centimeters in diameter, uh, about a quarter of those are due to only two collisions that occurred over the last 13 years. So collisions have a huge impact on space debris and space safety. And so what you can do is basically what we show here in this chart is there's a current rule that just says the probability of collision of each of your satellites needs to be less than 0.001 or 10 to the minus third. What the FCC has proposed is, hey, you can have as many satellites as you want in your constellation, but the constellation as a whole should have a probability of collision under 0.001. And with that, and combined with the flux density and the fact that you can't control a satellite that doesn't function, you can figure out what reliability you would need for each individual satellite. And it would be in the range of about 99.5% for constellations that are in the low thousands, as an example. If you had a constellation of 10, you'd only need a reliability of 53%. You get in the 50,000 range, you can see what you'd need there. Another way to look at this, though, is that once you know what those probabilities are, you can figure out a mean time between collisions. And so what this chart does is it takes the same information and it just shows that if I had a 0.001 probability per constellation, I'm going to have a collision probability of once each 5,000 years for each constellation. Whereas if I did it on a per satellite basis, once I get into the 50,000 range, you're going to have an expected collision once every 36 days just for that constellation. So the idea here is that now, if I, 
if I know that there are a certain mean time between uh, collisions for each constellation, I can now authorize hundreds or a thousand constellations. And just to put things in perspective, if it was once for 5,000 years and I had a thousand constellations, and right now we're probably in the low hundreds, this would be a collision every five years, which is more frequent than we've had already, which is already contributing to space safety. So these may not be the exact right numbers, but you can see that the methodology is, is right on here. And one argument is that, well, this doesn't really matter if you have constellations that are in sufficiently low orbit. But the point is, and this is a scatter plot of where the debris is from the Iridium Cosmos collision. And you can see that, that, that even though the collision occurred at 800 kilometers, debris spread as high as 1600 kilometers and down to, to about 300 kilometers. Uh, this chart here put together by uh, Hugh Lewis of the University of Southampton just shows the number of close conjunctions that you can expect as the size of a constellation grows, which is just a, another way of stating kind of the issue that the FCC observed. And what this shows is how long this small, these small debris uh, particles will last at, at each of these orbits. So you can see that, that uh, collision, even at a relatively low altitude, can add to space debris for decades, if, if, if not more. So this is, this, uh, is just an illustration of the problem. And the other point that the FCC made in their notice of proposed rulemaking is highlighted here, which is that there's an incentive that individual operators might try to deploy systems that tolerate high failure rates instead of pre preventing high failure rates. And that's exactly the point of having regulation is to present, prevent this tragedy of the commons, which is kind of a game theory result of, of uh, individual uh, decisions. There's also spectrum, serious spectrum coordination implications. And this is just a picture of the, of the sky, a polar, you know, a, a radio polar plot from say, I think this is from New York City, of what the sky looks like with 40,000 satellites in the Starlink uh, uh, filed orbits. And what you can see here is essentially there's no angles, there's no look angles available for any other systems to use that spectrum. So this is creating, some uh, spectrum coordination issues because you don't want that once one system is filed that you preclude any other systems in the future from ever, ever, uh, ever happening. So uh, one example of this is what we're, we are interested in LEO as a way to add a low latency component to our service by combining LEO and GEO. Our approach there was very high capacity for satellite on the order of 10 to 20 times that of, of some of these uh, early mega constellations per satellite, which means we can have many fewer, more reliable satellites. We can leverage the ground network to get this high capacity and we can meet the FCC's proposed rules. So this is, this is what's going on in the US, but this is obviously a global problem. Uh, and, and what's extremely concerning is that the initial mega constellation failure rates are about 30 times higher than the FCC target would require uh, for just the sizes that are licensed already, which isn't even the entire amount. And this is clearly not just the U.S. issue, although the FCC aggregate uh, collision rulemaking is still under consideration. Uh, we believe that ad strong advocacy is needed for comparable regulation for international administrations. Essentially say, uh, if, if the system's not safe, uh, that we're not going to provide landing rights. And we think one of the other points here is now that this is happening with these high failure rates, that really the, the regulatory bodies are essentially looking at implicitly approving unreliable satellites if nothing's done, which does create a high collision and safety risk. And that because these failed uncontrollable satellites can't avoid uh, collisions, uh, it, you're likely to see that if one company or entity gains some competitive advantage by uh, having a fault tolerance system that tolerates high failure rates, that there will be imitators and uh, that there will be other systems that try to do the same. And so you'd want to have regulations that don't uh, inhibit new innovative NDSO spectrum applications and avoid this tragedy of the commons. So uh, we think that with the FCC's proposed approach, that safe use of space for hundreds of innovative NGSO constellations is achievable, and that these are pretty simple and effective policies. 
And uh, although they're being opposed by some, we, we would urge everybody to, to research this and, and to support the, the policy that the FCC has, uh, has proposed and to help uh, use that in other administrations around the world. So that was my prepared presentation. I uh, know there's a lot of information there, tried to get a, a lot of it through, but I'd be happy to take questions uh, for the next few minutes. Yeah, thank you for that, Mark. And we do have a few questions, and I think we have about 10 minutes left, so we'll see, uh, see if we can get through a few of them. Um, the, the first question, uh, I'm going to take moderator's prerogative and ask. Um, so uh, a core theme in the remarks you just gave was reliability, right? How do we, how do we estimate reliability? How, what is the appropriate re level of reliability to accept? Um, so I'm going to ask you, how can you work with your spacecraft vendors to actually improve reliability? And what do you do pre-launch um, to work on the reliability aspect? Okay. So, uh, so number one is that that's a very common problem in space and, and largely it, it results from the, you know, in the past, especially the cost of access to space was very high. So what that meant was you didn't want to launch uh, something into space that wasn't going to be reliable. So, oper so operators are very motivated to test reliability. And so you do that through some combination of analysis, but especially through test. And one of the things that resulted from that are, as an example, space qualified components so that you can know that uh, all the components that you're using on a satellite are going to work in a, in a harsh space environment, uh, environment. And that often involves, for instance, destructive testing. The big trade off here is that the things that make things reliable in space can make the satellites more expensive or, or, or take longer to manufacture. So I think one of the warning flags is that if you see operators that are really emphasizing, look how inexpensive our satellites are, or look how fast we can build them, it's a little bit of a flag that says, okay, maybe we are prioritizing low cost, rapid manufacturing time over reliability. But I think that for people that want, you know, prioritize reliability, it's achievable through combinations of redundancy, screening, thermal vacuum testing, all those, all those uh, processes. All right. Thank you. Um, so we're going to switch now to a, to a different part of, of the problem. We have a couple of, of, of audience questions around end of life and, and satellite um, you know, post-mission disposal, essentially. So uh, currently, as you know, we operate essentially to a 25-year guideline. Um, and compliance with that guideline is, let's say, not great, right? Um, we, we know that, that operators... Um, uh, compliance, I think, is around you know forty percent or something like that. If you look at the ESA numbers, um, so what is your take on on end of life compliance, um, and and how about spacecraft that that remain operational past their design life? Do we need to think about um, handling that that aspect differently? So, so those things are kind of indirectly applied to the uh, uh, aggregate collision model. So think of basically think of the twenty five year uh, uh, you know the orbit time as one constraint, but that's not, and, and the point you're making, which is not everybody, not compliance with that isn't great, but this reliability spec is actually a, a more a stringent rule because with the 25 year rule, you can still end up with large numbers of satellites in space adding to debris. So what we think is that, that more rules, are, you know, that some more, something more stringent is needed. Now, what, uh, what you're talking about is basically what, what you need to do to comply is a reserve enough fuel in the satellite life so you can actively deorbit it. Okay, and if you can't, then that becomes essentially an uncontrollable satellite. So that, what that means is each operator would need to have a good understanding of their fuel use, number of maneuvers, the amount of fuel that would be left, and all that would contribute to is your satellite controllable over the lifetime at which you estimate. So what we're looking at is a combination of both and analysis and then actual on orbit measured performance to, to achieve that. All right, thank you. Uh, so picking up on, on that theme and how you're measuring um, that uh, risk and, 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 and the downstream of the collision, uh, collision risk essentially, um, going back to the table that you presented, um, you, know, you said 53, 99.5 and, and 99, right? That table. Um, 
did that take into effects downstream uh, downstream effects? Did that take into account downstream effects of a of a collision? So is it, or is it just yeah. looking at it? Yeah. No. So I mean, one of the points is that. You know, I think some people are saying, wow, this is, this is a really strict rule, but you can look at a number of ways in which it's actually quite optimistic. Number one is the NASA DAS model only takes into account the debris flux that's present at the time of the application. The actual debris flux will be much worse if there are collisions, or even, for instance, if you do an analysis on a 40,000 satellite constellation, when you do the first thousand, you're not including the effects of the other 39,000 satellites, right? So that's an example. It's a very optimistic, calculation from that perspective. Then the other thing is, you know, the, the term is Kessler syndrome, where you can end up with a cascading effect of a collision creates more debris, which increases the likelihood of further collisions. None of that's even included in that. So that's actually a fairly lenient interpretation. And that, that is what the FCC's suggested rule is, but we think it's so much better than what the rule is now that, that we're, we're supporters of it. Thank you. Um, scrolling through. So we have about three and a half minutes here. Um, <laughs> this is an interesting one here that I'm going to ask. Um, so going back to the conversation you're just having about improving reliability. Um, the question from, from the audience member is, is there a point in which we improve reliability too much and then you flood the, you flood the skies with, um, with overly redundant, redundant satellites and um, you, you potentially make, make your challenge even more, more significant. Well, okay, so um, you know what the FCC, I'm gonna put this in FCC terms, what the FCC is gonna do is they're going to license, grant a license for about 15 years. And what you can see now is, uh, with LEOs especially, you're looking at operating lives of typical, five years is a lot. Right, so so that those numbers were for five year life and, and achieving you know ninety nine percent for fifteen year life that's an aspirational goal. Uh, it doesn't mean that it can't be achieved with sufficient redundancy or screening, but I think we're so far away from that that we don't really have to worry about a reliability that's longer than 50, longer than the license term. All right, thank you. So I've just been given um, a, a two minute warning here. So. Uh, I want to thank you, Mark, for your remarks and give you one kind of closing, uh, closing question. Um, you touched on this a little bit in your presentation, but um, Viasat has earlier this year planned to uh, announce a plan, filed a plan to switch from a Mio, oper Mio constellation to a Leo constellation. Um, how does that change your perspective as an operator on what your responsibilities are in terms of, uh, of responsible operations and, and SSA information? Well, uh, so one is, I think if we're going to advocate for these for these rules, the first thing is, we, you know, which we think make complete sense because we want to be an NGSO operator, uh, that we want to that we ought to comply with them. So the, the main thing that we did is we said, wow, this, you know, in order to achieve this, how can we get accomplish the same mission that is very very high capacity. Uh, econ both economically and with high reliability. And, and the conclusion we came to was, rather than getting five or six gigabits per second, you know, useful per satellite, let's see if we can get a hundred or, or more. What, what are the, you know, what are the design approaches that would do that? If you can get a, you know, 20 times th the throughput per satellite, you'd need 20 times fewer satellites. So you can see that would make the reliability more achievable. That's the approach that we've taken. And it's actually, it's actually the same approach that we've taken in geosynchronous orbit. Uh, that's how we get the economics that I showed in those charts is to get the highest capacity we can through each individual spacecraft. All right. Well, thank you. We've been given the, uh, the high sign here. So Mark, thank you for your remarks. I uh, will do a virtual round of applause. We, we missed that in the, in the virtual environment. Um, and I will say from my moderator's perspective, the, uh, the FCC uh, rulemaking is open for comment for a few more weeks here, I believe. So yes. please, uh, please go and, and take a look at that. So yeah. thank so you. Thank you very much for inviting me in and thanks for your really good questions. I appreciate it. Mahalo and a hooey ho until we meet again. We thank you for sharing your time with us. We hope to welcome you to Maui for the 22nd Amos Conference, September 14th through the 17th. Aloha.